All right, now the mute's gone. See, two years in and we're still having mute problems. It's kind of fun in video calls. Uh, my name is Jesse, everybody. I am your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got some new faces in the crowd today. And so, if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through like a gazillion live free interactive broadcast. I think we're on number 75 since September 12th. It's insane. We just don't sleep and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but now that October is here and we're in the midst of it, we are diving in with a whole bunch of incredible space programs. We've done a lot of conservation. I love conservation but I always love the opportunity to explore other worlds, explore the cosmos, learn about all these new amazing things going on in space exploration. It is truly the coolest and best time to be interested in space ever in human history. More is happening, more investments going in, and there's some really exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. So today, uh, actually, before I, I dive in with our speaker, I want to note, um, a housekeeping note, we've got a Kahoot today. So for our live group, for our YouTube audience, if you guys want to participate between our talk and our Q&A portion, pull up Kahoot.it on a separate tab in your computer, use the game pin below. I'll make sure everyone has that before we start it as well. Just a fun extra way of being inciting and interactive. Now, Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Heverly. He is an engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So this is the most elite, iconic research facility, uh, you know, bringer of dreams in the cosmos uh, place on this planet. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory is a place we always love to visit. We uh, have had the privilege of hearing from amazing NASA engineers over the last five, six years, talking about some of their incredible work to explore Mars and other places throughout the solar system. So Matt's going to talk to us today about the Mars Sample Return Mission, this proposed idea that we could go to Mars, pick up some of the, the soil, the, the dirt, the rock that makes up our, our neighbor in the cosmos and bring it back to Earth to study it. The more that we study uh, the planets, our neighbors in the solar system, the more we learn about the Earth and the more we pursue knowledge for its own sake. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to blow our minds over the next 20 minutes. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, welcome to the broadcast. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. I'm super stoked to be here with everybody. Uh, totally appreciate you guys having me. Absolutely. Well, if you want to dive in with your presentation, we'd love to take a look. I know we've got some interactive bits today for our classes as well. So keep those fingers on the on the triggers there, classes that are with us in StreamYard. <laughs> All right. Let me get my presentation. Let's see. Can you see my screen? I've got it up. It looks great. We've got it's almost full screen. We had that same thing that we did in the test. So we've got stickers. right there. there we go. Perfect. You're good to go, man. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks, Jesse. So like Jesse said, I am uh, an engineer. I'm a, specifically a robotics engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So I'm talking to you today from Southern California. And the JPL is one of 10 NASA centers around the United States. And every NASA center has their focus. And our focus is the robotic exploration of the solar system. So we don't have astronauts here at JPL, uh, but we have lots of robots. And I specifically have spent my career uh, building robots to study the moon and Mars. And over the last 17 years, I've really been focused on Mars. And I want to start out today with maybe a question to the class. Who, who can help me understand, you know, why do you think we want to explore Mars? Why is this a place we go so frequently? Why is this a place we care so much about? One of so my Jesse, very... can you help me with some questions or some answers here? Absolutely. So YouTube classes, feel free to chime in in the chat as well. I'll head to Mr. Chaddock's class in Chalk River. What do we think? Why are we going to Mars? Why are we going to Mars? I think they might want to go to Mars to see if there's like life there. Because it's close. Because it's almost like Earth. It's yep. Yep. sort of habitable. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hancock's class, Georgetown, do you guys have any thoughts why we might go to Mars? Why should we go to Mars, everybody? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. To do some more exploring, to continue our explorative nature as humans. Awesome. These are great answers, Matt. <laughs> we'll save yeah. that. For, I know you've got a next question coming up, and we'll save that for our other classes in a minute. So I think our first answer really got all of them. So one of the things we... We like to explore Mars because it's close, right? It's way easier to explore Mars than Pluto. Uh, we can get to Mars. Usually it takes about nine months for our robots to get to Mars. It takes about nine years for them to get to Pluto. So that makes it a little bit easier. Um, one of the other reasons we're exploring Mars is because, you know, it looks a lot like Earth. It's a rocky planet. It's about the same size. Um, so we can learn a lot from about Earth by looking at Mars. And, and really the the reason we're doing the, the exploration that we're doing now is to try and understand what did Mars look like in the past and could it ever have had life? So when we look at Mars, 
you know, here's kind of an artist's picture. You can see on the left what Mars looks like today. But on the right, <clears throat> you can see what scientists think Mars used to look like billions of years ago. Earth and Mars are both about four and a half billion years old. That's just so hard to wrap your head around. But for the first billion years, Mars used to have a dense atmosphere and it used to have water and it used to have oceans and rivers and lakes on it. And it looked a lot like Earth for that first billion years. And when we ask, well, what happened? And Earth has this magnetic field that protects us. It is this invisible force field. Um, it's why you can use a compass here on Earth. Um, but one of the other things that happens for it, it's got the spinning magma core, which creates it. But it helps protect us from radiation and uh, cosmic particles that are coming from the sun and from, from deep in the universe. And uh, they kind of come and they bounce off of this force field that we have. And Mars used to have a magnetic field similar to ours for the first billion years. But then that spinning magma core kind of dried up and stopped spinning around and the energy slowed down and the magnetic field went away. So when the particles would come from the sun, you can think about it like you're playing pool and there's a whole bunch of pool balls. And those pool balls are the atmosphere. And if you come in with your, your pool ball and you hit it and they all scatter, some of them are going to be stripped away and go back into deep space. And after billions of years, Mars's atmosphere got lower and lower density and it all got stripped away. So now the atmosphere is only about one, uh, one one hundredth of what we have here on Earth. And that means that water can't exist on Mars as it is today. But when we go look at Mars, these are some pictures from the Curiosity rover uh, that's still exploring and driving around Mars today. We see these rocks that can only form in the presence of water. These are sedimentary rocks that formed at the bottom of a lake bed, an ancient lake bed on Mars. So we know that there used to be flowing water on Mars. And when we use our, our old rovers, this is the Curiosity rover again, a picture of its robotic arm reaching down and drilling into the surface. Um, it made more discoveries than just it used to be uh, a place where there was water. We could know what kind of water it was. So here you can see we're at the bottom of a lake bed. You can kind of see the shore of the lake coming across here. This is an ancient lake that's dried up. <clears throat> and we drilled in and we have some instruments on this rover. So when we put little pieces of the, of the dirt into the instruments. We found these organic molecules, carbon and hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, all these things. These are the building blocks that make up life as we know it. They're kind of the Lego, the essential Lego pieces if you were building life. They all need these pieces that are these organic molecules. So we found not only did Mars have water, which we know that all life on Earth as we know it needs water to survive, but we found these essential Lego pieces, these essential building blocks to say, hey, all the ingredients for what we know of, of for life used to exist on Mars. And after making that huge discovery, that meant that Mars used to be habitable. It used to be an environment that could have harbored life. And now we're shifting our focus to not ask, well, was it habitable? But actually, was it ever inhabited? So we're actually going and looking for life. So here's my next question to the classes, and maybe some of them heard me at the beginning and might be a little cheating if you give the answer. But I would ask, how do you think we go look for ancient life? What are we looking for? Ooh, so I'll, I'll give our classes a second to put their thinking caps on for this. And I just want to note that you so casually show a robot on Mars, a picture of it taking samples. And that is like the most incredible thing that humans have ever done, probably. I mean, it's just unbelievable that we have that capacity to do that and share that picture. Um, Adelaide Hoodless, our, our Hamilton crew, what do you guys think? They can see us. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Was Mars ever inhabited? Yes. Perfect. I was not raising. I was not raising my hand. I was not there before. What do you think? I was not born. I think so. I mean, you think so? We got a lot. We got a lot of things. So, and then uh, also Matt from YouTube, MK inside rocks, like look for fossils. We've got people talking about looking things there. Miss McNamara's class. What do you guys think? You want to chime I'm still in? Waiting for a question in here, Freddie. Oh, sure. <laughs> 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 Bones. Bones. We think there's bones on Mars. And then one last for good measure, Mr. Shadows, class student right there. Old microorganisms. Old microorganisms. Old microorganisms. Wow. Those were some excellent answers. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I'm going to take two of those and I'm going to smash them together. And I think that's really what we're doing. 
So if we were to go look for ancient life on Earth, a lot of people think of dinosaur bones, right? We're going to look for fossilized ancient dinosaur bones. But one of the things we, we think about with Mars is there was really only about a billion years where we think it was habitable. So Earth and Mars are both four and a half billion years old. For the first billion years, they were very similar. And then Mars stopped being habitable and Earth continued along. So when we think about it that way, we think, well, if evolution happens the same everywhere in the universe, how far did evolution and, and the development of life get after a billion years? And when we go look and answer that question on Earth, this is what we find. We only got to the level of bacteria after a billion years. So these are some of the oldest fossils that we can find on Earth. This is in Australia, and these are called stromatolites. These are fossilized microbes. And, and then you, you can think of on Earth, as evolution continues, we got then maybe tadpoles and then maybe dinosaurs and then maybe people as evolution continued. But of, after a, a billion years on Earth, we only got these fossilized microbes, these stromatolites. So this is the type of fossil that we're looking for on Mars. And this is really, really hard to find because you can't just go and dig it up and there's the dinosaur bone. You need lots of things to tell, was this actually a fossilized microbe? Was this just a rock that had a weird structure in it? Um, and the way that we're trying to answer these questions is with our latest rover that's on Mars named Perseverance. And this is actually a selfie that our rover took. You know, it reaches out its robotic arm and snaps a picture of itself. And there's its little companion off to the side. It has a drone helicopter friend that flies around with it named Ingenuity. Um, but this rover and this helicopter are currently exploring Mars, trying to really answer these questions of looking for these ancient fossils, uh, these ancient uh, microbial fossils. And the place that we sent it on Mars is a really, really cool crater called Jezero Crater. And this is an impact crater that happened uh, two to three billion years ago or actually older than that, um, because it happened during the wet period of Mars. And what you can see in this picture is a river delta. So here in the upper left-hand corner, you can see this, this inflow channel or this river snaking into this crater, which had a giant lake. And then as the water flows into this standing body of water, it all precipitates out and creates a delta. This is what we might see on Earth uh, when a river goes into a lake uh, and that's what we see here from orbit on Mars. And the reason we're going to this delta is because if you think about it on Earth, when it rains, all this stuff from the surface gets taken down into the river. And then the, the river, it'll flow with all this kind of junk from the surface into the lake, and then it'll come down, and then it'll get buried, and it'll get fossilized. And river deltas are great places to look on Earth for fossils of ancient life. So this is where we're going on Mars. We're looking at an ancient river. But a lot of those fossils aren't going to be just sitting out on the surface. We have to actually look a little bit in the subsurface. So our rover has this very cool instrument. It has this giant robotic arm. And at the end of this arm, it has a giant drill. So this is a big rotary percussive jackhammer bum, 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 kind of drill that's drilling through the rocks. And at the end of this drill, we have what we call a coring bit. So it's a hollow drill bit. And as it drills down, it will collect a little piece of the surface of Mars, a little piece of this rock that's about the size of a piece of chalk. And we're going to collect this rock. And we can look at it. We'll do a little bit of science on it. But one of the things that's hard is, you know, there's this uh, saying, Carl Sagan, I think, had this saying that, uh, great. I always get it confused with the Spider-Man saying. And Spider-Man saying is with uh, great power comes great responsibility. And Carl Sagan said, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So if we're going to claim that Mars used to have life, we need a lot of evidence to really back up that claim. And we don't think that we can actually get enough evidence just with our rover that's there on Mars. We can't make the instruments, the scanning electron microscopes, all these other things that we need to really go look for these fossilized uh, microbes and tell that for sure they were made from life. We can't shrink those things down small enough to put them on an instrument. So what we need to do is we need to bring all of these little chalk-sized pieces of rocks back to Earth. 
So our rover is going to put them in a little test tube, and then they're going to drop these test tubes on the ground. We're going to make our first collection of these uh, in the coming month. We're actually November 4th, I think, is when we're going to drop our first tube on the ground that Perseverance has collected. And we're going to drop it at a place known as Three Forks. Um, all of our places on Mars we name after famous places here on Earth. Um, so Three Forks uh, in Montana. Uh, and this is what it looks like. This is an actual picture that the rover has taken. The mountains that you see off on the right-hand portion of this image, this is the delta that we were seeing from orbit, but now we're seeing it from uh, where the rover's sitting. This is a nice flat place for us to go where we can put these tubes on the ground and then another mission can come grab them and bring them back to Earth. And that's the mission that I'm working on called the sample return mission. We're gonna go get these samples and return them to Earth. And the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna have a lander that's gonna land there at Three Forks on Mars. And then the tubes are going to be, you know, 200, 700 meters away. And we're going to take more drone helicopters, kind of like the Ingenuity helicopter that's flying around on Mars. But we're going to put some wheels on it and we're going to put a little robotic arm on it. And this drone helicopter is going to go grab this tube and it's going to fly it back to the lander. And then a robotic arm on the front of the lander is going to grab this tube and it's going to put it in a rocket. And we're going to collect 30 of these sample tubes and we're gonna put them in the top of this rocket and then we're gonna, for the first time ever, launch a rocket off of the surface of another planet. And in the front of this rocket is gonna be a basketball sized container that's gonna have all of these sample tubes in it. <clears throat> now this rocket is only a little bit taller than you and I. Uh, it's only two meters or, or so tall. And it doesn't have enough power to get all the way back to Earth. It only has enough power to escape the Martian gravity and get out of the Martian environment. So what it's going to do is it's going to go up and it's going to start orbiting around Mars. And it's going to push this basketball-sized box full of rocks out of the front of the rocket. And then this basketball-sized box full of rocks is going to orbit around Mars. All right. how? Let me pause and ask another question. How do you think we're going to get that basketball back to Earth? Anybody have any ideas? Mr. Hank Garth Glass, what do you guys think? I, I'm sorry, Jesse, I missed the question. We were talking about that visual there. What was the question? Yeah, I mean, it, it is, you're Matt, you keep throwing these distracting pictures up at us. <laughs> I'm, I'm lost for sure. But we've got the basketball sized group of samples that are in orbit. How do we get that back to Earth? Like, what are we possibly going yeah, to do? Yeah, we were just talking about it. It's like, it looks like a needle in a haystack. It's so small, right? And to get that back to Earth, Elena, how are we going to do it? Little tiny booster rockets. Little tiny booster rockets are going to propel it back to Earth. Or we're going right. to cross our fingers, right? I like, that, I like that thought. Adelaide Hoodless Crew, what do you guys think? How do we think they're going to send this back? Do you think they were saying, the last group was saying propulsion. What are we thinking? Yeah, propulsion. Propulsion. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have like a, a little rocket yeah. on it that's going to get it back. Um, and Mr. Shadow Class, you guys are right there. They're going to shoot it out of the rocket. And since there's no gravity really in space, it's just going to go to Earth. And I'm pretty sure it's going to land in Illinois, it said. Okay, we're okay. Gonna blast in specifically Illinois. We're getting down to the state level of getting it back to Earth, which I really appreciate that, that is, you know, detail. <laughs> that is a great detail. Um, we'll talk about where it's going to land back on Earth. But this little basketball-sized box full of rocks doesn't have any rockets or any thrusters or anything on it. So what we have to do is we got to send a whole other spacecraft there. So we're going to send this giant spacecraft called the Earth Return Orbiter, this is being built by the European Space Agency. So this whole mission is so big that not even one country is going to be able to do it on its own. So this basketball up here, this, uh, this other orbiter is going to have to come and find it. It's going to look for this little tiny thing floating around Mars, and it's going to find it. And then it's going to have to come and rendezvous with it. You can see this kind of opening here at the front of the spacecraft and it's going to go just grab this basketball and hold on to it and then this whole spacecraft is going to turn around and it's going to come back to earth so it's using a using a technology we call electric propulsion it's got these big solar panels so it can generate a lot of electricity and it's going to turn around and it's going to come back to earth with this basketball sized box full of rocks and then it's going to push it. It's going to put it into um, an Earth entry capsule. And when it gets close to Earth, it's going to push this thing out in front. And then this Earth entry capsule is going to come and ballistically, so it's not even, it doesn't have any rockets. It's going to come and it's going to hit the atmosphere and slow down 
so much that it can land safely. And it's actually going to land in Utah, um, not Illinois. But the reason we're doing that is we really want to be careful when we're bringing something back from Mars. We don't know what's there and we don't want anything on Mars to contaminate Earth. So we need to make sure that this thing stays sealed and contained and doesn't have anything escape into our atmosphere. And when we do that, we have to be 99.9999% sure that it's going to work. And um, parachutes aren't that reliable. So we're going to build this to land without a parachute. So the way that I can think about it is a badminton birdie. If I were to throw a badminton birdie, if anybody's ever played badminton, when it comes down and floats down, it doesn't go very fast. That's just because it has some aerodynamic drag that's going to slow it down. We're going to do the same thing. It's just going to come and it's going to slow itself down, but then it's going to crash into the ground. And we're going to have it crash into a place called the Utah Test Range, which is a military testing range where they test rockets and missiles and things like that um, so that nobody lives there. So this doesn't accidentally land on your house. Uh, but then we'll be able to go recover these samples and put them into a special facility with all those instruments that we wanted so that the scientists for generations can go explore uh, and look and, and try and understand these. And there's still scientists today learning new things about the samples that we brought back from the moon. Uh, so I'm sure there will be scientists for decades to come that will be looking at these samples. And one of the things that I love most about this project is I think we are trying to answer the most fundamental question of humanity. Is life unique to Earth? Is, are we alone in this universe or this solar system? And while we don't believe that there is life that could be living currently extant life on Mars, we're really understanding, was there life in the past? And if there was at our closest neighbor in the solar system, what does that mean about where life might be in these billions and billions of galaxies out there uh, beyond our own galaxy? So that's the story of the Mars sample return. What we like to say at JPL is we like to dare mighty things. This is a really, really hard project. We are sending robots and helicopters and rockets and rendezvousing with a basketball around orbit of Mars and bringing it back and landing it at this very specific place to keep everybody safe here in the United States. It's a really, really hard project. It might not work. But it might, and we might learn something very fundamental to who we are and our place in the solar system. So that's all I got today. Thank you guys very much. Um, and I would love to answer whatever questions people might have. Oh, Matt, that was a spectacular presentation. And again, throughout, you're talking about all these incredibly detailed and technical things that require so much math and engineering skill. And it's a classic engineer thing to say, oh, yes, we're going to go pick up the basketball around Mars. This is a, you know, decades of expertise with the top minds in the world that are working on this to accomplish. And I really hope you're going to take the marketing opportunity to, to, to call the spacecraft that goes and gets it like the basketball net, or like an interplanetary <laughs> dunk, something like that. It's, it's right there. We'll, um, we'll work on that one. Okay, before we dive in with questions, and I'm sure our classes have a lot, we are going to take us to our Kahoot. So this is going to test a little bit of your understanding. I've got our pin up on our screen, so feel free to join on this. And Matt, you can give us hints when there's like a couple seconds to spare. But for those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And you don't win anything, but you do win Matt and I's everlasting respect. So I hope that that is uh, more than justification enough. We are going to kick it off in just a second and dive in and uh, go from there. So here we go, folks. Let's start with our first question with our Halloween themed background that they give me for some reason. I like it. All right, I'll pull that pin off the screen. First question, true or false? Mars is on average much warmer than the Earth. This wasn't really related. I just wanted to play with you guys and have a little fun here. Matt, feel free to unmute your mic too if you want to hang around. True or false? 26 answers already. Get those answers in. What do you think? Much warmer than the Earth? Colder than the Earth? The same? Matt, any hints? <laughs> my, my hint is, is Mars closer to the sun or further from the sun? That might tell you. Woo, literally 50-50 split. It is much colder than the Earth uh, because it is further away. My mom has a hard time with the mnemonic. My very educated mother just served us nachos. Uh, it's like, which one's the M, Mercury or Mars? But it's, uh, it is it is Mars, our fourth planet from our sun. And Silly Griffin currently has our lead on that front. So let's go to question number two. How many missions have we sent to Mars? We're talking about several missions here with this Mars sample return needing, needed to be done to sort of pick up these samples and bring them back. In our history, 
And it's roughly, is it five, is it 10, is it 50 or so, or is it a thousand missions we've sent to Mars? Any idea, Matt? Hmm. Well, I've, I've worked on more than a handful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite a few of you thought 19, uh, 50 was our correct answer today. So it's around 50. We're getting more and more going there all the time. So this one's going to hurt a lot of you guys in our leaderboard. Agile Wolf takes our lead. Going into our third question, another true or false. We think Mars might have looked more like Earth in the past. This is directly in the talk. So, Matt, you might have to leave the broadcast if you ever get this one wrong because you did lay it there. <laughs> you laid it on thick in the middle there. All yeah, right. Yeah. Ten more seconds. I will note, too, you mentioned in your talk stromatolites. I'm going to bring up that name on the screen again. Everyone should look up stromatolites when they're done this program because they're so unassuming and they're so fascinating. And we can find them alive still in Western Australia. So most of you got this right, almost all of you. Well done, guys. We go into our final question with Agile Wolf still in the lead. And let us know who you are in the chat, by the way. Why is it important to study Mars? Ah, it helps us understand more about the Earth. The pursuit of knowledge is reason enough. We can assess how habitable it might be for mankind when our students mention this in one of the questions, or all of the above. Anyone familiar with my cahoots will know that I particularly like one kind of answer in questions like this. <laughs> spoilers, spoilers. Um, all right, we'll get our answers in. Let's see. Most of you got that right. It is, of course, all of the above. It's so important to do these this research for its own sake, but we are also learning so much about the Earth, about other planets, planetary formation, and just just in general, blowing everybody's minds. Agile Wolf came in third, Stelly Griffin second, and first, our winner, gold medalist for Matt and I's everlasting respect, amiable hair, way to go. And with that, we will dive in with our questions. You two groups, feel free to start sharing in the chat. But we're going to head to Georgetown and Mr. Hancock's class for our first live question. Welcome in, guys. Hey, you're welcome. Awesome. Great. Uh, I got a question. How much time do you have? Because we, we have to do it. <laughs> sure. Uh, a few students were, were wondering um, about how many test tubes are on the rover right now, as well as there was a lot of and thens. Um, so what? how do you plan these things? How do you plan for the unknown? People are curious about. What could yeah, go wrong? Awesome. Good question. We got 43 tubes on the rover right now, but we can only bring 30 home. So our rocket, you know, that rocket's not that big. We can only launch 30 of them. So we're going to pick our favorite 30 to bring those back. Um, and then the and then there's a lot of things that have to go right with all of these missions. And we have to test it and analyze it and understand exactly how each of these things can happen. When I think about just landing on Mars, we are going to land at a place on Mars about the size of a soccer field. That is how accurately we are going to land our mission on Mars. And to think about all the things, the parachute that has to work, the navigation system, all the rockets that have to land, just land it safely. That's just one little part. So the, the real answer is there are a lot of very talented people who spend a lot of their life looking at this. It takes about 10 years to do one of these missions. Uh, so we spend a, a lot of time working on these things to make them work. Yeah. You also answer the question of our YouTube group with that, the planning process. It's always one of our popular questions with Mars mission. So thank you very much for that, Mr. Hancock's class. Uh, Adelaide Hoodless, let's head to you guys. Uh, come on in for a question. Hey, guys. Go ahead, ask the question. Um, I have a question. <laughs> My question is, why do we need to live in Mars if we can live in Earth? Because... That's a good question. I don't. I don't think I really want to go to Mars. Like I like Earth. I'm. I'm a fan of Earth. But a lot of people want us to understand: Could we, as humans, be a, a multi-planetary uh, species? Could we go explore? Could we go live somewhere else? Um, there might be reasons for us if if we're having trouble on Earth to have people go to Mars. But from us at NASA, we're not really looking at making Mars habitable. We're really trying to understand the science about where did Mars, what did Mars look like? Are we alone? Those sorts of answers. And I think there's lots of other people who are trying to understand if we could live there, but that's not really the focus uh, for us at NASA. Yeah. Great question, guys. I'm glad we got that one. Ms. McNamara class, come on in. If you have one from your students, take us away. All right. It looks like Tyler is wondering if you plant a tree on Mars, you get oxygen on Mars. So I'm, I'm wondering if he's thinking about ways of making it habitable for people. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. I think the tree would have a hard time because it's minus 50 degrees C on Mars. So I don't know if the tree would, would do that well. 
Um, but yeah, that is a good question. And there are lots of scientists who have proposed trying to grow plants on Mars. And could we create some oxygen? Could we create food? Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Martian, uh, but you know, Matt Damon growing some potatoes on Mars, that could uh, be a, a solution. So yeah, we're, we, we don't know the answer to that question and, and people are asking it and that might be a future experiment that we might do. I'm so glad you referenced The Martian because just like Jurassic Park inspired so many people to become paleontologists, I've got to expect that The Martian's gonna inspire so many engineers because it's like the ultimate uh, demonstration of how amazing you can be as an engineer, especially if you're in trying circumstances. So way to go, Matt Damon and the entire production team. Uh, Mr. Shattuck, Chalk River, come River, on back in, guys. Hi, my name is Carter and um, if, if there is rovers on, on Mars and Mars is very hot. How come the rovers aren't overheating? Yeah, yeah. good question. Uh, so it's really cold on Mars most of the time and normally we have to keep them warm. So that's one of the problems with all of our rovers and all of our landers is it gets really cold. Um, and the way that we keep uh, curiosity and perseverance warm is we they have plutonium on them. So the way they generate their power is they have a nuclear power source. This plutonium gives off heat that we are using to keep all of their electronics nice and, and warm. Uh, so that is one of the, the factors that we have to design for in this really, really harsh environment is the temperature. That's a great question. Yeah, we've got one of our classes reading The Martian right now, and they actually showcase this in the movie is the need for a, a plutonium core basically to keep things warm and how that's used by uh, Matt Damon as the astronaut. Uh, Matt, before we go back to Mr. Hancock's class, take some from our YouTube friends as well. I'm curious about your career path. So how do you end up getting to do this stuff where you're planning and facilitating Mars missions? Because it sounds like the most metal job of all time. So what, Yeah, what, I, I love my job. I can't believe I get paid to do this. Every <laughs> Monday I'm like, oh my gosh, this is where I get to go and what I get to do. Um, and fundamentally, I'm a robotics engineer. So when I was studying in school, I studied mechanical engineering. And I love the idea that we could build a thing that would do something smart and make a decision. And, and I love robots and I've worked in lots of different robotics areas. And right now I, I work in space robotics. Uh, and so I studied engineering, went to graduate school, started working at JPL, building giant robots to go explore the moon. Uh, I've had the privilege of being a rover driver. So I've been able to drive the Opportunity Rover and the Curiosity Rover on Mars. Uh, so it's been a wonderful, wonderful career. And now we're we're going to answer this really big question, bringing samples back to Earth. I, I can't believe I get paid to do this job. Yeah, I, we, we can tell that. that uh, your passion has shone through for 33 minutes now. Um, Matt, let's head back to Mr. Hancock's class. If you guys have a second question for us, come on in. Oh, we have many questions. Uh, we were curious, um, Mars and Earth, habitable, once habitable. Uh, one of our students was wondering, are there any other planets that were possibly habitable at one point? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. And one of the things that has come up recently in the last, I don't know, couple decades in the scientific community is understanding um, icy worlds. So when we look further out into the solar system, we see, and in particular, two moons. We see a moon of Jupiter called Europa, we see a moon of Saturn called Enceladus. And both of these are icy, you know, they have an icy surface, but we think that under that surface is liquid water. And there's sources of energy deep inside that planet that's giving off heat. And we think that there is a liquid water uh, uh, environment there, an entire world that is an ocean. And if you go below that surface and some of the initial things that we're looking at, it looks like they may have, um, some of these organic molecules, some of the same things we found, the Lego building blocks for life there. So a lot of our focus is probably going to shift in the near future to go understanding those planets. And in fact, JPL right now is building a giant orbiter called the Europa Orbiter, Europa Clipper, that will go orbit around Europa. Uh, and we're looking at, can we fly through some of the plumes? You know, there's, there's these giant um, fissures in the surface of Enceladus that are spitting out this water uh, and we're looking at sending spacecraft that could go fly through there to understand if they're habitable. So going from a rocky body, kind of like Earth, to an ocean world, uh, those are some of the places we're going to go explore in the future. I'm going to get up the YouTube link for all our students in the YouTube chat and StreamYard chat in a minute because we've done a program on the Europa Clipper. And the fact that, again, we can target this 
where you're literally flying through a jet coming out of a planet. The, the specification, the math that's needed to have that level of accuracy is insane. It's, it's like, it's unfat. There's no parallel for that in anything that anyone's doing in their day by day lives as a student or as a science educator. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, Matt, let's head to our, our Adelaide Hoodless crew. If you guys have a second question, come on up. So Emily has a question, okay, Emily? Emily, take care. Uh, what is the hardest part about building the rail race to Mars? Uh, the hardest part about building the rovers to Mars. That's a great question. It's probably that it's got to work. So we spend a lot of money on these missions and it's super duper hard and everything has to go right. And the amount of pressure is, oh, it, it keeps me up at night sometimes. Uh, but when it works, there's no better feeling. I remember I had worked on the Curiosity rover for a really long time and watching what we call the seven minutes of terror, which is this thing coming down seven minutes where we're not talking to it, where it has to be all on its own and land safely on Mars. And I heard those words from Mission Control that said, touchdown confirmed, we're safe on Mars. And my heart just oh, was so filled. I had spent 10 years of my life working on this thing. I was the driver for the rover, so I had to go into work. So whether it crashed, I needed to find a new job. Um, and just the, the exhilaration that when it happens and we make these amazing discoveries, it's the hardest part, but also doing hard things. They're some of the most rewarding things that you can do. I have loved in our space programs over the last few years that NASA started sharing the footage of this, all the scientists in the control room waiting and, and so excited for this moment. And it's just, there's no, again, there's no parallel. It's a decade of work and effort and billions of dollars and so much excitement and fanfare and you're on the news and all of a sudden it's all coming down to this, you know, moment of truth to see that your work paid off. And, and again, uh, you guys have had such a spectacular run of success the last few years. Again, students are growing up these days with so many rovers and missions on Mars. You can see images from Mars on your computer in an instant, uh, you know, that were taken a few days ago. And that's astonishing. That's something that didn't exist when I was a boy. It didn't exist when you were a boy, right? Like we're uh, very lucky. And one of the things I want to say, your question earlier was really good in Kahoot. How many missions have we sent to Mars? It was about 50. Um, the follow-up would be how many of those have actually worked? And it's really only about 50%. About half of the things that we have sent to Mars have crashed and not worked. Um, so we're getting better. We're learning our track records improving. But it is a hard, hard thing to do. Um, it doesn't mean it's not worth trying. Uh, and we might fail, but we, we learn from our failures and then we go try again. It's a really great message for our kids. Um, Matt, a question that I don't know if our classes would have thought to ask before I go back to our live groups. So when meteorites strike a body in space, when something hits into the Earth, it shoots up some of the Earth into space. That's true of the moon as well. So we actually have moon rocks on Earth that we didn't pick up as astronauts, but were blasted here when something hit the moon, knocked it off <clears> the <throat> air. That is true of Mars as well. We have little bits of Mars on planet Earth. And so I'm curious how much of Mars is on the Earth from past meteorite strikes on Mars that we've identified compared to what we're going to be getting from the Clipper or from, not from the Clipper, from the sample return mission. Right. And, and we have a few Mars meteorites and we... We can confirm that they're from Mars. We can do a chemical analysis and say that these rocks are not made from Earth. The only way that we can have this ratio of these isotopes is from a different planet. We can confirm that they're from Mars. Um, a couple of things about that is those rocks have been floating out in space for literally billions of years where you know they go from Mars, they orbit around, and then sometime the gravity pulls it back to Earth. And it's it's been heavily modified by that impact, right? That has a ton of energy that may have destroyed anything that was there. Um, so the real reason we're going is not just to get a rock from Mars, but to get a rock that is well-preserved that's from a place on Mars like a river delta where it might have preserved evidence of ancient life. So while yes, we do have rocks from Mars, we're really, we want some very specific rocks. And that's why we have all this big giant mission. I hope our students have had the chance to go to a place on Earth in their life that uh, I, I've always heard it described as a landscape that makes you want to spontaneously burst into applause. I've been very lucky to go to places like that. And the picture of the Delta is like that. Like you just want to like, you want to cry a little. You're just like, oh my God, it's so amazing. Um, Miss McNamara's glad we're going to come to you guys. Mr. Shattuck to wrap up. Uh, guys, time flies and you're having fun. We've got about five more minutes left, but Miss McNamara, come on in. 
Okay. All right. I have a student who is very interested in designing robots. I was wondering if you had any advice for him. Paul. No. My advice is go design some robots. Um, <clears throat> so I, we have a Lego robotics team here uh, in my little neighborhood and the kids that are in late elementary school, middle school are in a Lego robotics league. The high schools have robotics teams. Um, building projects on your own, um, making a, a skateboard that has a little motor in it where you can control it. That's a robot. Just figure out something that's fun and go build it. And it might be hard and it might not work the first time, but like we said, go try it again. And really just going and having fun with it um, and, and just dive right in. It's the way to go. I just put in the chat for StreamYard, uh, First Robotics, which is the leading international organization for getting kids interested in robotics and, and giving them the opportunity to, to, to compete with them. I know in my high school, we had a guy who made a robot that shot volleyballs at students. He got in trouble for that, but he was a genius and now gets to do, I think, robotic stuff for a space agency uh, here in Canada, which is very exciting. Uh, so I've just put that in the chat as well. Uh, great question, Ms. McNamara. Mr. Shaddock, come on in with one final question and uh, we'll and, share some stuff here and go from there. Go from there. Hi, uh, my question is like, since you said earlier that like, Mars looked like the Earth uh, and it had water, and where did the water go? Did it like evaporate or did it just suddenly disappear? Yeah, great question. And you're exactly right. It evaporated. I don't know if you guys have done a science experiment where, you know, I guess we've all been cooking, you know, you heat up your water and off it goes, that same thing will happen if you decrease the pressure of the atmosphere. So you'll get that same evaporation. Uh, and when the atmosphere of Mars went away, so did all the water, it evaporated. Now we have found water in the form of ice, right? You can have a solid of water that can still exist at that low pressure. And we had a mission called Phoenix that went to the North Pole of Mars and it had a robotic arm that was kind of like a backhoe and it dug under the surface and look, there was ice, like lick, or a solid water H2O ice on the ground. And then we came back the next morning and then all the ice was gone because we had removed it and exposed it to the sun. So it all evaporated or sublimated away. Um, so we know that there was flowing water because we've seen all those rocks. We know why the water went away because we understand how the atmosphere has changed and we've seen evidence that there's still some water in the form of ice there. So all these are little clues to tell us what Mars looked like in the past. And that's what our scientist, scientific team is doing. They're looking at all these clues, making and putting them all together and really understanding how this planet has changed. Matt, this has been an impossibly cool broadcast. Uh, I get to do this all the time for a living, and this is still one of my favorites I've done in a very long time. So thank you so much for everything today. Um, before I ask you one final question, I want to just note for our classes, you want to learn more about the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, jpl.nasa.gov. There is no institution in the world that does better educational outreach than NASA. Check out their website for some really great stuff. Specifically, and as a niche thing, the Visions of the Future series they did envision places like Mars, other planets in our solar system, and places across the galaxy as if we went there as tourists. I think it's one of the coolest art projects I've ever seen, and I really encourage our kids to check it out. And you did me the great favor of quoting Carl Sagan in your talk today. So Carl Sagan, for students who might not know, is the poet of the universe, the greatest science communicator of all time, and in specifically in his book, Pale Blue Dot, which I encourage every kid to read, he has some of the most incredible quotes of all time. You can look all of these up. You can check out YouTube videos on them. My favorite YouTube video in the world to this day is the Pale Blue Dot speech from Carl Sagan on YouTube. Anyone can check that out when they're done. Matt, before we let our classes go and give them, come bring them in to say a big thank you and farewell, is there a final message about Mars, about this mission, about your work that you want to leave kids with today? I think my biggest, the thing that I would want to challenge people to do is to find something that you love that's hard. I feel like my career has been super fun because not because it's been easy, but because it has been hard. And we've had challenges along the way, but those successes are wonderful. And if you can find something that you care about um, that will give you a reason that you'll want to go to work every day, where you might fail a few times along the way, um, find that for yourself. You will have a wonderful career in front of you and you will make huge contributions to humanity. Matt, there is no better message than that. And so, uh, again, it's your first time joining us to wrap up the program. What we do, we bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Mr. Hancock's class, Ms. McNamara, Mr. Shattuck, and our Adelaide Hoodless crew, thank you so much for being with us live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.